Hello out there in YouTubeville. 
Hold on, boys. Welcome to another live stream coming to you straight from Atascadero, which means mud hole in Spanish. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a wonderful day today, it's beautiful weather, and uh, everybody's hunky dory. Everybody's feeling good, and I hope you are too. So, we've got Gail working the message board today, and um, Wes is here. So, Wes, tell me, what, what do you got in store for us today? What do you think? Uh, we, there we go. There's my oh. mic. We got, uh, we got some fun stuff today. We already got 35 people on t right now watching. And uh, mm. Alan Blake asked, that's a towel? And that is a towel. A towel. And that's part of our, our little comparison we're doing today, trying to talk about is the L5 the best Gibson guitar for jazz? Obviously, everyone would probably say yes, but I don't know. That towel Farlow sounding pretty good. Well, it does sound good. And you know what? It cuts through a little bit. You know, I played a gig in, with my L5, and, and Gail has heard me play a million times. And she said, I don't know if that's the right guitar for you, uh, uh, for this gig. I think the low low end was getting lost. Um, but anyway, I played this at another gig just recently with a little big band. Kind of thing sounded great. So it's like, geez. Uh, so anyway. And yeah, we got also got the, your 68 L5 back there. I mean, yes. that, thing, that thing obviously sounds great. But... Also, the uh, Gibson 775, and that thing is kind of like a, uh, you know, an underrated player in the game, I think. You know, well, you don't it's... hear about it often. and Yeah, they only made it a couple of years. Yeah, so anyway, we got uh, that comparison we'll be doing. Um, speaking of Gibson, they they did it again. They, they another Another mysterious discovery. <laughs> from their in their vault they this oh, is really? like this yeah. is this is just something that they've been doing the last year and a half where they just miraculously f dig up these crazy weird old <laughs> things that somehow were lost and i don't know it's a little weird but how how all of a sudden did they find these uh these new artifacts that are decades old so i'm going to tell you about that coming up and then um <laughs> plus the world's best guitar collection is it moving to dubai <laughs> what 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 we'll talk about that oh, deal the, a deal to buy goody. some of the world's most expensive <laughs> guitars um also uh, as a jazz guitar player do you have a responsibility what as a what as, as a, a jazz guitar player do you have a responsibility no you have no responsibility uh, as a jazz guitar player, what, what does that mean? Uh, exactly. What does that mean? <laughs> does it mean anything? Yeah, you know no, no. That's I'm why I'm most, telling you, there's most jazz guitar players live in their car. Jazz guitar no players is, is, you know, keeping the jazz genre alive. Is that resting on the shoulders of jazz guitar players? I think it should be. Well, we're going to talk about it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and then we, I also, I'm, I'm excited about this. We're, I'm. Mom and I were we're we're kind of we're working on a new festival workshop oh, idea. Oh yeah, don't be announcing that. Oh stuff. no, I'm I want to I'm gonna ask you guys what you want. We need ideas. Okay. We need to right. see, drum up interest. I'm trying to see. We're we're. I mean, it's the earliest stages possible. Where it's a, an idea at this point, but it's an idea yes. that I think you know could turn into something big. I mean, it's I, like. Like I think your, it could too. Like yeah. your jazz, Yosemite Jazz Workshop, that started as a little idea, and now that's a big deal for everybody, you know? It is. It so. is. And yeah, yeah. So, we, yeah, okay, we, we can definitely talk about that. Yeah, what do we, you uh, What do you got? What have I got? Yeah, what do you got planned? Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a thing about tonality. Oh. I'm going to do a thing about scales, uh, the the... Which I have a feeling I did it last week. I can't remember if I did it or, or just showed it to somebody on, on the Jazz Accelerator program. I can't remember. That's, but it's a little major scale trick. And then I was going to do a thing on... Uh, there was one other thing I was going to do, and now I forgot what it was. 
Well, I'll, I'll think wow, about you it. You got later. some senior moments kicking in here. <sighs> Tell me about it, man. Good God, it's yeah. just never ending. Wow. Never. You go into the other room. It, what does Bill Cosby say? I, he says, "I think your brains are in your ass." Because you walk into the kitchen to go get something, you walk in, you forget what it is. You come back, you sit on the couch. Now you remember. You got a little boost there. So, um, so yeah. There you have it. What's on the message? Who we got going here? Mick Mac. Hey, Francis, how are you? Yeah, uh, he's doing the Jazz Accelerator program and doing quite well, I might add. Robin Rings, loving the AR-480. Thank you, Robin. Your setup and custom string set is great. Thank you. That is a... That is a spectacular guitar, the 480, man. I, I wish I could get more of those. God damn. You just can't yeah. get them. And we, I mean, you also have an Eastman back there. What, what, yeah, this is a three, 372. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's uh, a nice little guitar. I love it. I, you know, I'm, I like, I like it. I like a lot. I really like it. It's, you know, it's one of these guitars that you could actually fly with, go to the gig, play great. You know, it would perform well. Get on the airplane and then have it lost or it fall out of the overheads and break and you can go get another one. Uh, so sometimes flying with some of these real nice guitars is, as uh, Bruce Foreman said, you're playing with fire. Oh, you play with fire. Um, uh, he never returned as a horse this year. That's Al. Al, how you doing? All right. Lewis Taylor's sweating in Chicago. Apparently it's hot back there. Whoa. Patrick Evans. Um, I love Fresno in the springtime. I love Fresno in the fall. But summer can be worst of all. Bada boom. Yeah, that's the truth. Uh, it's got to be hot there. Although you got a break, you know, you had some rain and some hurricane weather. And, hurricane, and, we had hurricane and, in California. Except for us, it passed right by us. It just made yeah. it hot. It was great. Um, Pablo <laughs> or Paulo is here. Sure, L five is the best jazz dream guitar. Uh, let's see, Joseph Valentini. Rich always sounds great. What a blessing. Thank you, sir. And uh, Andrew, Andrew, Sarah already answered the question. He says, yes, yes, it is. Next question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there, here's, let me tell you the flaws of the L5. Yeah, let's hear it. Okay, number one, the body is very big. It, on a 17-inch, you know, this is 3-inch. That three, extra half inch can do a lot of damage. It's, it's a little, little bulkier. Um. And it's, you know, you got hard wood, hard solid woods all around, very prone to feedback. At higher volumes, you can't, you know, in a band situation, higher volumes, you can't hear the, the beautifulness of the L5. It gets washed away. So um, if you notice West Montgomery, like those uh, European um, black and white, shows he's got his amplifier sitting right next to him right here and he, there's an acoustic piano can you imagine the volume he's at it's hardly anything right and uh and his guitar sounds beautiful you know but think about it when you're on a stage you got a bass electric bass player a keyboard over here masking all this sound what do you hear out of the guitar you don't you don't hear some of those nuances you don't hear. Uh, I've heard L5s as being one of the worst sounding guitars. When, when, when I've gone to a concert, you know, a jazz concert, and heard guys play, and I mean a bunch of guys, but if they do a solo thing, it's one of the best sounding you're ever going to hear. So it's, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. There's no guitar that can do everything. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. This, also, gosh, this how they have it set up in the strings. I mean, remember, wh where was that? Oh, yeah, over in Nashville. Remember 
that one guy had was playing that super 400 that super nice old thing and that thing sounded awful <laughs> and you're like looking at this beautiful old yeah. huge yeah. guitar and you're like thinking man that thing's got to put out a, just an amazing fat sound yeah ay 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 that thing was <laughs> ice pick to the forehead yeah ay 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 so yeah anyway um Dalibor Panj- Pankovic says, uh, hello from the Netherlands. Rich is born to play vintage Gibson. Alan Blake says, I have all... Born to play. There you go. That's it. That's born to play I Gibson. played my Gibson. Although, if you want a nice Gibson, get a heritage. Da, da, da. Has only brought me pain. When are you going to learn Gibson, boy? <laughs> it's on that Tal Farlow. That's like when you're, you're, it's a great song. I don't know. Yeah, that's a, know. That's a cool song. Uh, Roland uh, Mueller's here. Uh, another Roland, what's happened? Another uh, uh, guy yeah. up in Seattle in the accelerator program, just just accelerating right along. Just cruising right on down the highway. I love it. Um, We're all on the same road, right? We're all on the same road. Some start on the road a little earlier than others. Uh, let's see. But uh, it ties us all together. Mark Larkins is here. Mark, what's happening, man? Kirby in the house. What's going Kirby. on, Kirby? Kirby L. What's and, happening, Kirby uh, L? Rhythm Golf. I'm here, he says. Rhythm Golf. Hmm. Welcome. I got rhythm. I got good golf. And then Lore Vault um, is here. He's our uh, our friend over in India, uh, who's oh, a yes. big, big jazz fan. Um, All right. Eddie Davis. Eddie, what's happening, man? Yeah. I get your emails, man. He's playing all over the place. Way to go. L5, Lech, Lechlin. It's too big for me, yeah. Um, you can have her. I don't want to. She's too fat for me. He, I don't want her. You can have her. She's too fat for me. Uh, Lechlin Mac, Maclier says, I think that's how you say it, but he says, L5s should never fly. God would have given them wings. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, you shouldn't take them on an airplane. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, you're right. You're right. And uh, Mark Wilkerson out of Dallas is here. He's going to send Rich his copy of Gibson Boy if he wants it. Yep. Oh, we yes. Want it. Yeah, I want to hear that. We Absolutely. Want it. Absolutely. We want it. Yeah. Uh, Mark, that's right. Didn't you transcribe a little bit of the solo, too? Yeah, I think so. The solo is that man. That thing is lightning speed. Phew. That dude, okay. That dude Thank you, play. Mark. That'd be fantastic. So anyway, um, yeah. Let, let's play. How about we play another tune? And well, and we'll uh, we'll start uh, cycling through a few of those guitars. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, here's. I, a tune, and I saw a video of Eddie Davis playing this Midnight Blue. Great tune. Hold on, I got to caffeinate. Um, yeah. Here we go. Wait a minute, should we play it on a well, different guitar? No, let's sit, let's play it, let's play it on this, and then we'll we'll, we'll move on. Thank 
classic ending right there. Classic, man. Yes. Well, we're done. We're done. Absolutely. Cut it. Cut it. Next. Next. So, yeah, that's a great little tune. Um, yeah. And it's on the website. Of yeah. course. Of course. Midnight Blue, right? And I, That's correcto mundo. And that's a... Well, who, whose tune is that? Kenny Brill. Yeah, that's the one that they ding us on... Uh, on YouTube for that. <laughs> for Do they that always one. Yeah, you don't like that one. We we have to share now we have to share our cut our our fifty cents that we're making off of this live stream with <laughs> Kenny Burrell. So there you go. Well, Kenny. couldn't go to a better guy. There you go, Kenny. Hell as you know, that's what we we're doing. Um yeah, so why don't we uh swap out that guitar? Can and uh and um, I'm going to read some more comments. All right. Go read. read. Andrew Sarah says, The versatility of the L5 is seriously underrated. My 90s L5 with P90s oh, nice. is great for not only jazz, but also country, rockabilly, and blues. Mm -hmm. Scotty Moore played an L5 after all. Yeah, it's uh, Merle Travis. Yeah. So. Merle Travis had one. Yeah. So uh, which guitar did you want me to get? Let's do the L5. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is a 68. Yeah. Um, Joel Henderson's here. Um, Joel's are, are, he's in the program. He's in the accelerator program. Joel. Yeah. Jo Joel Henderson. He says, I'm here. No, he's not. He, oh no no he's not I'm thinking of the, hi Joel uh, but I remember Joel yeah yeah Joel <sighs> Joel took ah, man that, I'm still reeling from that lunch that you took us out to that was that was a really good restaurant oh that, that was, was great that Thank was you. over in Nashville hey uh, Joel actually I think I had an email from you I just came across it the other day I don't I think it was old you were asking about a 575 and a couple other guitars or in and I felt bad I didn't respond back I don't know I don't know what you were asking I sorry well maybe you can ask it here ask and, it here we'll, Joel we'll, we'll answer it but he did have a question right now he says is that Tal Farlow available for sale oh no oh hmm. <laughs> all right but they're out there you know they're out there um, Todd Richmond, our buddy down in Lompoc, just down the road from us. Uh, Lompoc! Always impressed by Rich's uh, economy of motion, particularly the left hand. Yeah, exactly. And he says, hello from Vandenberg Village. There was a space launch on Tuesday night. Did you, oh, did you shoot, get to we see missed it. it. It was late. It was a later one. I was, I was in bed. Did you see any UFOs over there, Todd? Have you ever seen any? I know they're there. They're checking us out. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Alan Blake says, uh, no one, and I mean no one, would be able to tell if you were playing that Kenny Burrell stuff on an L5. Hmm. I agree. I agree. You know, all right, so here's the other disclaimer about everything. We're just going direct. We're we're not we're not going through any amplifier, and you know certain guitars, depending on the output of the pickup and stuff, are going to respond to that amplifier differently. So, you know, so why did I even say that? It's just the way it is, you know. You got to check the guitar out with an amp and uh, stuff, but because they do sound awful lot alike just going through the the mixer. Yeah. Although this is pretty dang smooth. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Um, Todd says uh, he can neither confirm or deny that he's seen UFOs there at Vanderbilt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a hot spot out there. And there's just so much open land between like Santa Maria and Lomp and Lompoc, man. It's just it feels UFO y out there, you know. Yeah, and you know, it, it used to be Vandenberg Air Force Base, now it's Vandenberg Space Force Base. Right. My father used to work there. My uh 
my uh, nephew, I, was, I guess he's my nephew, was in charge of security over there. And uh, it's wide open places. He showed us, you know, hey, look at all, here's the nuclears and all that stuff. And, you know, Vandenberg was supposed to be the next, the, the place to launch the shuttles. And the, everybody was really hoping that that would be it. The town was all excited because people would come in to see the, the shuttles being launched, but uh, it didn't work out. So, too bad. Too bad for Lompoc. Well, um, yeah, so what do you... As your grandfather would say, it's put in a spot that only hell would have it. Really? <laughs> Lompoc's not that bad. It's a cool spot. The weather's nice. Is it? It's windy well, it's as better, hell it's all the time. better than Fresno. Well, f- or any place in the Central Valley. And we lived in Fresno, outside of Fresno, forever. I would much rather spend a summer in Lompoc than I would in Fresno. Yeah. Any day of the week. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, and look at Todd just. Um, no, no, he, he retracted the, a message on there, so. What did, what do you mean? Oh, he did. Yeah, the, but then he re- restated it. So what? The what? UFO thing. So there's something fishy going on. There's there. something going on here. Woo-hoo. Yeah. See, even Todd says Lompoc beats the hell out of living in L.A. Oh, that. Yeah. No kidding. That, God, L.A. Man. Jeez. You know, unless you live in Beverly Hills or Venice Beach or. Brentwood, you know, you know uh, so crowded. Uh, uh, yeah. You're like you're like stuck where you live there because you don't want to go anywhere because the freeways are so jam packed. It's like you might as well be living on an island. Yeah. I know that's an extreme. Yeah, but. it's it's pretty tough down there for sure. Um, so anyway, you got a, um, another little tune we could play, or maybe we could just take a quick sampling of Midnight Blue on that thing and see how it sounds. What do you think? Um, you know, I think I, 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 I think we ought to do that. We, you know, we could play a little more Midnight Blue. Yeah. I can't think of... I mean, I got some other songs, so, I mean, but if I you want to do a real bona fide if, comparison... If we're going to... Uh, Let's get our money's worth out of this thing since we're sharing the the monetization now with Kenny Burrell. Might as well just beat the hell out of this song, right? <laughs> That's right. Here goes another another half a penny to play. Uh, Thank you. 
Well, there you have it. I don't know that this this one's it's it's different than that towel. It's mellow, mellower, isn't it? It's like a little yeah. It's that like you said that towel farlow cuts through more. Cuts through. Cuts like a knife. Yeah, that's pretty pretty big difference. Yeah. I I mean, I don't know. That's this one. I don't know which one I liked better though. What what did you guys think? Um, I guess it's just up to the t- up to the taste. This this one sounds it sounds older. It sounds like it has more you know, like You know what it sounds like to vibe, me? It sounds like a real nice pair of mufflers on a 55 Ford, you know, like the real That real low kind of rumble, you know, you know, it's not loud, it's not, but it's there. Right. Like my car. Hey, um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, yeah, these are great. Let's, let's try a little country on it. Frets are lower on this too. You know, it's it's a few things. The frets are lower, so where then you pick up a little more of the uh, fretboard. You know, so all that matters. All that matters. Anyway, there's a song there somewhere. Yes, um, uh, Al says he uh, prefers Tal's uh, Venetian cutaway. Plus, it has that the the curly Q thing. It's on It's got it. the curly Q, and Which, that curly Q is worth a lot. That's it's pretty hey, cool. Hey, why don't you open the door? I mean, when you came, when you went out and you came in, the cool air came in. We don't need that door open, do we? Or uh, shut? Can't I we mean, open the door? No, we, we probably could. Oh. Let oh, me walk all the no, way awesome. over here and open the door. Yeah. I don't know. It didn't feel that much cooler outside than it does in here. Okay. But, all right. There, all right, we there go. you go. He's back. Whew, man, that's a yeah. long walk. Hey, uh, so I w- the first UFO sighting from a credible source was over Mount Rainier National Park, 1948. Well, isn't that a trip? All right. And then Don Spain said it was 1947. Okay. Either way, down late 40s, we'll go with. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay, Stephen K said, what about the garden spot of the valley, Reseda? Mm. <laughs> so I grew up, I, you know, we moved to Thousand Oaks, or not Thousand Oaks, uh, Canoga Park, when, when it was new. So anybody... Um, uh, familiar with the San Fernando Valley. I mean, it was fairly new. It was 1955. And uh, Jerry Mathers lived right up the street. And it was it was hot, but it was nice, and it was new. Uh, now it's just, you know, yikes. It's like all those cities down there just kind of, they do they not just blend together? Like oh, they do. They it's one giant city. There's nothing in between anything anymore. It's it's yeah yeah. It's, and it's, it's expensive no matter where you're at. It is expensive. That's the and weird it's part. Like, I guess because you're close to industry and business and all that stuff downtown. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to say my dad drove to Hollywood. Down Ventura Boulevard. I don't even know if the freeway was there then. It had to have been. It had to have been, but I don't know when they put in the freeway. Um, so uh, Vincent Kowski here says he has four L5s. Really? But if you want an L5 on steroids, get a Campoloni mm-hmm. with a humbucker. I believe that. He makes a wonderful guitar, man. He really does. I don't know his payment arrangements, but uh, you could probably get something and make payments, you know, 
while he builds it. I, I don't know. I know he's back ordered it quite a bit, but yeah, yeah he made a, a friend of mine got a super four hundred made by him. It's beautiful. Just oh beautiful. yeah, those are pretty, just beautiful. Pretty sweet. You don't know the uh, the price range on these guys? I have no idea. They're, they're up there. Yeah, they're there. So, well, was there a price on this website? No. No. Oh, hey, well, prices. Let's if see. If you have to ask the price, you can't. Yeah, there you go. No. Standard is 5500 Deluxe series is seven grand. Special series is eight. And the cameo is ten five. Wow. The cameo. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's that's a that's a lot of flame there. So show the one for fifty five. Uh let's see. Standard series fifty five. Can you make the screen big or is it big already? Okay. This is all the these it's the website. So okay, no inlays, got it. No it's a, pretty much like an Eagle classic. But that's got a floater, right? Hmm. Yeah. He can probably make it with a one inside. Yeah. Mm. Pretty cool. Definitely. Yeah. Wow, four L fives. Wowie. Uh, yeah, man, he beats you. Yeah, you need to catch up with him. <laughs> grab a couple more. I think the newer custom shop L fives are really nice, man. Jeez. Well, and we just uh, had one at uh, fella at the uh, workshop brought in an L five, a West Montgomery. That was that was nice, beautiful. Uh, so, uh, sounded nice. Uh, Lore Vault says, I'm no expert, but it feels like Tal Farlow being such an amazing soloist, his records do seem to have slightly bumped up mids in comparison to, say, Barney Kessel or Joe Pass, who did more chord work. Have you noticed that his, like, does it, his solos seem to cut more than, you know? I don't know. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's so many factors there, you know, the, how it was recorded and whatever amp he was using and where the tone knob was on the mixer. Who knows? You know, it's... Right. Uh, Bobby Cox Jr. Um, is here. Alan Blake says your solos were different on both. Well, yeah, but nah, you still get a good taste of... You know what they, uh, yeah, what they sound like. Yes, I worked in Canoga Park for many years. Well, I used to live right behind the Canoga Bowl before the Canoga Bowl was built. And I remember when it was built, everybody got all upset. Oh, we don't want a bowling alley here. And, but then they ended up getting it, and uh, we all got free bowling as a kid. Man, go over there and bowl anytime you wanted for free. And then they had a bar there, and the bar, they, they would have, like, the ink spots. Petty, Petty, uh, Peggy Lee played there once. It's crazy. Uh, does, yeah. uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, well, here's one. I've been st stumped for only a year. Uh, are you related to Doc Severin? So, no. They, his name is Severin. He's got a S E V E R. And S O N, so mine's yeah, he, like C Severs and, and yeah. So yep. Uh, Joe Paluca says yes. The L five is a fabulous instrument. Uh, just listen to West Montgomery, and you'll know why. Yep, that's true. Now Jim Hall, apparently, the story I heard had an L five and did not like it, and, and I forget what he traded it for one seventy five or something. Really. <clears throat> so anyway um, and Mark Wil Wilkerson says I I miss Art Bell <laughs> me too I, li I used to listen to him all the time man yeah. coming from the desert out there nice mm -hmm. and George George uh, whatever his name was took it over Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, anything else here before we continue? Jim Rolfe, the freeway wasn't built when I arrived in T.O. in 1957. 
Really? Uh, yeah, I believe. Wow, that's a trip. Yeah, so Ventura Boulevard. Do you remember when Thousand Oaks Boulevard, I think, was called Ventura Boulevard? Because Ventura Boulevard went from all the way from the San Fernando Valley all the way to Thousand Oaks. That was a two-lane road. Uh, yes. I thought I saw Rob Riggs here. Where where did he yeah, go? Yeah, he's in, he's in there. Robin Riggs, how are you, sir? Yep. Oh yeah, he, he was talking about his 480. All right, let's do something, man. For crying out loud. Well, I wanted to talk about um, so as a, as a jazz guitar players, do you have a responsibility? Remember, I said that at the beginning yeah, of the show. Yeah. What does that mean? Jazz is dying, is what I mean. It is. It's always been. Oh, yeah. You know, all those new bebop players that are keeping it, you know, it's so popular with the kids. And, you know, in oh, 20 years, it's just it's just growing. <laughs> Come on, man. It's of course it's dying for sure. I mean, the only people playing there's a handful. I, I was trying to find new jazz this week on Spotify to talk about on this. And it's 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 difficult. There's there's fusion and stuff like that. But. Man, to try to find someone that's writing tunes like your kind of tunes, like the West Side of Heaven and stuff, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. only a few guys doing it, you know? Yeah, um, well... So anyway, like, yeah. what I was saying is, if you're, a, if you're a jazz guitar player, even if you're not a pro, even if you're aspiring, you're, you're, you have a, an upper level of at least musical knowledge probably than the average rock guy, right? Yes. So, should you just should you start teaching? Yes. And then trying to get you know if if you even if you were just you know doing it a little bit on the side you'd be doing a service to the genre to keep it alive, and maybe spread it to some like some younger kid who then is gonna you know grow up and want to pass it down to his kid. But if he you know if he never gets introduced to it all they're you know they're not even gonna right right so yeah. so that's what i'm saying you know if you're a jazz guy you're probably good enough to teach and you, pro oh, yeah. you probably should you should if you want to learn something teach it so yeah you should and and you know a teacher is such a powerful influence and can turn turn a kid on to something Hey, have you ever heard this? I remember I, Mike Dana talking about his guitar teacher playing him a West Montgomery record, and it's like, what is that? Well, I've never heard that. You, they don't play that on KRLA or KFWB, right? They don't play this kind of music. So, you know, yeah, you should. You, you should teach. I think it's good. Or you, even have just a guitar club or, or something. At your church, something like that. It's good. Yeah, and I mean, um, otherwise, yeah. Like I just, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm popping around Spotify trying to find some new, new stuff and listen to some jazz. And I'm not even a big, huge jazz fan. Um, I enjoy music in general, but yeah, I was like, holy crap! I couldn't. You one guy that that's doing it is you, like a uh, the you know Bobby Broom. And right, well, Bobby, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. I was there's well, few, David Skinner Mark, says jazz is not dying in Norway, right? That's well, that's that's another thing. And you know, what's funny is, um, even just I, I, we probably have, um, I, I can totally see that. I bet you jazz in all parts of Europe and Asia is way and it is way more respected. Well, it's a, it's a it's a uh, American art form enjoyed by Europeans. <laughs> right. That's what I've heard. Yeah. But they, and they got some fantastic players over there because they're listening to it. You know, it's part of their life. Right. But I mean, even uh, even just in general, a couple other things that I noticed is, I mean, that you, everyone else has probably noticed too, and not just me, but. Music with guitars in general is kind of being phased out. There's not a lot of big guitar-based 
rock bands even anymore. Well, like, yeah, like metal bands and what have you. And yeah, stuff. sure. I, I but mean, there's it, acoustic guys. There's, acoustic there's some acoustic guys. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm mainly talking about in like the modern rock kind of genre. Cause well, what are they playing? Keyboards. I guess it was. I guess it's like the '80s, kind of, you know, when like all of a sudden, keyboards were on everything, when like the new wave kind of stuff started coming out, and yeah, um, I feel like there's a kind of a stage of that. But metal, metal guitar that that can never be replaced. You simply need a nine-string guitar to play metal. <laughs> hey, look! Listen to this. Um... I've never been so optimistic about the future of the music. Huh, that's what David said. That's that's great. What's the old joke? A rock player plays three chords to a thousand people and a jazz chord plays a thousand chords to three people, yeah. Yeah. Um, but in, oh, another observation that I did have too is even just the s different parts of the country, mm -hmm. the, the U.S., right? California... Oh over here is it's a whole lot different than it is in ar around nashville kentucky the carolinas because oh, yeah, yeah. man when we were over at that chet atkins festival mm -hmm. the amount of young kids that were just incredibly awesome at playing guitar was was insane I you'd know. be like walk into the the hotel lobby and there would be a group of like 10 kids in a circle all just like but aren't doing Ripping. jamming together and just taking turns soloing and having like the the best time you could tell just how much they love to play guitar and how much they love that genre of sure. bluegrass and stuff and you that you don't see that here in California. Everyone's doing yoga and <laughs> you know I don't know. Yeah, I'm too worried about what they look like or I I don't know. It just it's I, that was a big thing when I when I was over there. I was like, wow, that is really cool. These kids are really really into playing this kind of music that like over here in California is just not as popular, you know. But they love it and it was. They're really refreshing, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. It's like it's it. like California is this like own country almost, you know. Well, no kidding. Well, what what is it? The fourth could could be the fourteenth largest country. Or um, it's it's like the the, you know, well, I don't forget what they say, but like the seventh or eighth biggest like economy in the world yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think we struck a nerve because you're getting a lot of comments about this, about jazz is alive and well in American colleges. Absolutely. If it wasn't for the colleges, it'd be gone. We want studio bands, you know, having the, the jazz bands and stuff. And God, that's so, so nice. Right. So who knows? Uh, who knows where, where everything will go? Everything's circles around doesn't it right. you know, circles around um <clears throat> one thing i noticed a long long time ago when we went to france uh when you li listen to the radio they would play a jazz tune a rock tune uh a classical piece they'd play some folk music there was no um at least back then there was no set format the dj would play whatever he wanted to play and uh, I thought, wow, that is cool. Of course, I come, you know, it's public. It was uh, funded, you know, by the by the public. They didn't have the demographics and have to sell advertising, and and that's what it's all about, you know, selling advertising. So you can keep your, keep the thing, keep the record spinning, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Laura Vault says, uh, I've been giving free jazz lessons to a lot of many rocker rockers for years. I don't even earn from it because I react art and design at uni for a living. Not sure what that means, but there you go. That's what I'm talking about is like, that's kind of, you know, he's a guitar player in India. Or oh, obviously wow. there's not a big scene, but he's to at least trying to spread it, and you know. Um, it'll come back to you, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Or you give away, it'll come back to you somehow. So, 
Um, that, that's fantastic. Don Spain says that he's in the Kansas City area, and uh, he says he sees lots of young people taking up jazz um, and said that uh, the jazz clubs are packed with young people in Kansas City. That's interesting. You wouldn't think of Kansas City as a big jazz spot but although are you kidding jazz jazz was very big in kansas city oh really I, yeah you I gotta just, do your history and I you don't have thought of that and uh yeah why yeah. is that i don't know it was the you know i don't know it's where that these people ended up and started playing yeah it just seems kind of just i'm going to kansas city kansas city here i come Um, and then Mick Mac says, uh, I'll teach when I'm good enough. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're, here's probably, you're probably, you're good enough now to teach oh, yeah. for yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, you're like, you got a huge musical background, like, yeah, but he's a violinist and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Wichita, Kansas. That's what Roland said. Played there a lot. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, I remember him chatting about that yeah. when he, li he lived over there. That's right. Um, Adam Falk says, From what I see as younger jazz, as a younger jazz guitarist, I'm self-taught and had good teachers. I feel a lot of the landscape of players are coming from jazz schools, and I find they don't move me like the older guys. Yeah. Um, now, Eddie Davis, he, he's reprimanding you, Wes. Do not refer to California is only what happens in the South because Northern San Francisco, um, there was there, there used to be that was a big jazz place, man. San Francisco. I lived in San Francisco for five years. There's not a huge jazz scene in San Francisco. Not anymore. There is definitely one hundred percent not. What um, kind of music is there a music scene there? Oh, it was period? a great music scene. I would go to concerts every single night. Oh. Rock or pop or you know there's bluegrass stuff there's a few jazz clubs obviously it's a big city there's going to be a few big jazz clubs but i think probably the biggest jazz well-known jazz spot there would be going over to oakland to yoshi's yeah yeah so you would think that San Francisco would have its own Yoshi's, like a spot that's, you know, oh, everyone knows I'm going to Yoshi's to see some jazz. I don't remember that spot in in San Francisco. I lived in the Tenderloin and there was a jazz club, I Cat, Cool Cat or something like that. I can't remember what it was, but that place got pretty crowded. But I mean, that was... I. I feel like that was one of the only spots that I I knew, but you know I obviously wasn't hunting around for it or anything like that. But um, yeah, I I thought there would be more jazz in San Francisco than than there was there there was for sure. But yeah, I don't yeah. know. Um, well, you know, LA was was interesting because uh, there were jazz clubs and uh, that's where all the studio musicians, right? Yeah, you, you had all the studio musicians. There was so much studio work. Like, what did they say? I heard there were 200 sessions a day for just records. Didn't count commercials or television movies. Just records. God dang it, man. I mean, that's a lot of work. And so, yeah, when you get done, you, know, you want to go play some jazz. I mean, that was back in the day. You know, you could go... Uh, you go hear Joe Pass, you know, you go to Dante's, some of the clubs where uh, Dante's, uh, Shelley's Manhole. Oh, there was a few of them, man. Anyway, Lighthouse is still going on. Um, Laura, Laura Volt said the Ken Burns documentary ends on a positive note about the future of jazz because it shows jazz musicians around the world taking and it's really happening for real. What is the name of that documentary? I've never... Have you seen that? The Ken Burns? Uh-huh. I've seen most of it. Yeah. Nice. That'd be... Uh, I'd, you I'd should be watch it. It's really good. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, now you're moving on to the um, the 775. I am. Um, awesome. Let's uh, let's definitely hear that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So Eddie, I I yeah, he lived there for 15 years, and on Columbus Street, there, I don't know, I just then. I, I had heard that they were building a new jazz club. Like I, I had heard that there was jazz clubs on Columbus Street, and it was huge in like the '80s. And then those jazz clubs kind of went away, and I think even some of them turned into strip clubs, because <laughs> that's all along Columbus Street right there. And but I did hear recently that they're building a new jazz club, and they're trying to revive. The jazz scene in North Beach, right there. Really? So that would be cool. But as far as, because I, I my work was right by North Beach, so I, I was, I would walk into North Beach all the time, at least a couple times a week, and oh, yeah. it's a cool spot. It's great. Tons of restaurants. It's lively, but I never noticed. Uh, a lot of jazz there but I don't know like I said I wasn't actively seeking out jazz kind of like I am now so next time I go up there I'll have to uh, do it but man I'll tell you what I do not want to go there because <laughs> I do not want my car getting broken into well, why, why not well, geez. man you leave, you don't, you don't you leave to... a hoodie in your back seat and you got a broken window yeah <laughs> man and they'll, they'll snake that hoodie so fast um, Jasper says over here in the Netherlands jazz is still alive very much in the south at least are a few places to host an annual jazz weekend all kinds of bars and cafes open their really? doors to jazz bands so there we go we need to have an host an annual jazz weekend in the Netherlands I think oh yeah mm-hmm. Man, how long we does it take to fly over there I don't know. I think I, I, a friend of mine recently went and flew to Paris, and it was like 15 hours or 16 hours or something. Yeah, that's a lot of Jack Daniels. Yikes. Yeah. Uh, okay, Randy, Vincent, and Chris, and Sonoma Sunday. <clears throat> Let's see, Pat Evans says, think about the way you do your YouTube broadcast today compared to what Rich said about recording sessions. Think what you do now has an impact on the market? Uh, I don't know. It's starting to, I guess. I don't I don't know. I think maybe once once we have 200 viewers watching live at one time then I think I'll be like okay something's happening here but we're kind of we're hovering around 90 I'm see. grateful for everybody who comes here I know but man that just something happened there's the, we're on this you know we're on the dreaded plateau but it is ain't exactly clear <laughs> there's a man with a gun over there isn't that a cool song? Oh, yeah, for sure. Let's see. Uh, uh, Mike Walker. Tell me. I'm sorry. Mike Walker says, Hey, having, Mike. Having a great time playing the Guild. Good. Good. good, uh, good, good. I have plates. I've played the L5 before, and it was great as I played it through a Bose Tower. Oh, yeah. That would make it. You'd hear, hear every nuance of that guitar going through a Bose t Tower. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about, let's do a little lesson, shall we? Yep. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, what is tonality? Let's talk about tonality. Scale equals key, the key of something, which equals tonality, which equals tonal center. 
tonal center is quite simply this. If I go, you can hear the next note, right? These two chords set up the tonal center of this. So that, if I play these two chords, it's a two and a five, and it moves to the one, we'll call that a perfect cadence. There's other words, or we'll call it a resolving. Perfect has to be certain different voicings. All right, so a, a, a song may have several tonal centers, and it's all dictated by the chord of the dominant chord. That's why it's called dominant, because it points towards the tonal center stronger than any other chord. Okay, so it's dominant. So you're hearing that? So a song might have, um, uh, well, let's, let's, let's talk about, this sets up the tonal center. this. If this goes that's a deceptive cadence, right? We were all set to hear this. But what we heard is wow, it's like wow, we're in another key, right? All right, now that's a deceptive cadence. It's very dramatic. So a dramatic uh, doesn't always happen that dr dramatic in a deceptive cadence. However, it could be something like it's just as simple as this. And you want to hear this note, right? But you get... Now we want to hear this, but we hear this, and now we have finally resolution. Or we might have something like this, and instead of it going to here, it goes, and now it strays away to some other tonal center. And we want it to go there, but it doesn't, it goes. So our song might go. Then it finally resolves, right? So several tonal centers have just gone by. This is the key of, of B flat and the key of A. Then the key of G, and it's finally its resolution. So let's take a tune like Stella by Starlight. Stella by Starlight goes like this. That's the chords. It, it sounds like it should go here, but it doesn't, it goes. It somewhere else. It didn't go where it's supposed to, so it was deceptive. And this sounds like it should go here, but it doesn't. It goes. And then it goes. Then finally resolves. So, if, so far, in just the first uh, few changes of the tune, we're in different uh, keys. finally resolved. So we just went through three tonalities, three scales, three keys, three tonal centers. So as if you're playing a solo, you have to switch with those tonal centers. Otherwise, it's going to sound funky. So, <clears throat> so that's something to consider. You got to know your tonal centers. You got to know your two fives.
What is that noise? Now it sounds like that should go to there, to that tonal center. By the way, when you use flat fives, flat nines, sharp nines, all those extra chords, it increases the pulling power of the dominant chord. So let me show you. Here's the here's the a D7. What's the result of that, right? Now, if I add other tones, now I really want it's pulling harder. Do you hear it? We just can't end there. It's got to resolve. So, altered tones do that. They pull the they pull the listener's ear to a tonal center harder. Vada boom, vada bing. So you got to know your tonal centers. You got to know your keys. Really, really super important uh, if you want to play jazz. So when you see a two five one, you know exactly where what key we're in. So Stellan by Starlight goes. of cadence. the tune. Now I got a version here that's kind of a bossa nova for Mark. He likes bossa novas. You might have to adjust levels here, Wes. Here comes Jane down the aisle in the latest fashions. Hold it. Yeah. I like this song, man. I, I, I actually like it like this groove. Usually we play it so fast you can't even hear it. So come on, man, what's going on here? Oh man, you and your your MP3 player. Still one of my favorite parts of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so you still, after two, three years, fighting with that thing.
Anyway, there it is. Stella by Starlight. Camera. <laughs> Excuse me. So, where are we at, Wes? Um, let's see. I don't know. What, what do you, What do you got? What else you got going on? <laughs> oh man, I okay. Well, let me show you this major scale thing. All right, yeah. so here's a major scale, right? Right? Now, you know, when you play a major scale up, doesn't that sound like a bad note? It, 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 it sounds like either we're going in a different key. But I'm in a key of C. I think I did this last week. I did it sometime. Anyway, so um, that particular note is going to interact with the major seventh and it's going to want to resolve. All right, so when I play this, if I want to take out that note, It's a hexatonic scale. So we're getting rid of, rid of the fourth degree. But if we want to use the fourth degree, here's what I, is, is a nice solution. Hold on boys, and that's to go like this. You hit the note, but do you hear how it wants to resolve? There's a song there somewhere. So between the half step between the E and the F in the key of C, hit the F first, and then skip over it. And then we're going to have the same thing occur here. You hear how it kind of puts an end to the scale. If we don't want to put an end to the scale, let's hit that the C first, then to the B. So I get this. So once again, I'm going C, D, F, E, G, A, C, B, D, or I could start back at C again, do, da, D.
So it, it's kind of a cooler sound. Now I could even start the scale like this. So I'm starting on the C, but I'm resolving down to the B. So try playing your scale like that. I think you're going to find that against just even starting uh, uh, playing a C scale over a C major seven chord is is sounds stupid. But if I go, it sounds cooler, doesn't it? So that's a nice little trick, how to take a major scale, rearrange just a couple of little things, and now you've got a nice little lick. Ta-da! That's great. Uh, Mick Mac says, you're keeping the four out off strong beat? I don't think it matters if it's on the strong beat or the weak beat or it... it the four is what is making your ear want to go to that tonal center. Um, so it's going to interact with the tritone within the key, within the scale. Okay, if I play it this way, it sounds like it's already kind of resolving. And you could end it that way. Anyway, something to experiment with. I think you would enjoy experimenting with that. Yes, I do believe you would. Um, Lore Vault asked, um, Rich, Stella, sounding great. Could you explain how you think about repetition of a phrase in the middle of a solo? Okay, well, repetition, uh, you know, basically, it's, it's, you could play two ways. Well, there's several ways you can do this. Look at it. It's, uh, you could play an echo. You know, that's an echo. I, I echoed one, one time. If I, um, now it, I can echo two different scale degrees. Okay, if I do it three times, now it's a sequence. So it's a reasonable facsimile. It doesn't have to be a precise. Sequences can either be tonal or atonal. When they, if you take a sequence and exactly transpose it with all of the cell degrees, in other words, up a minor third, down a second, down a, down a major second, and now you transpose that, it's going to go out of key. So if, that's why we make it a tonal sequence. Now, you can do that same type sequence and then just change keys so let's go back to Stella Yikes. <laughs> my heart what happened to it god damn it oh yeah here we go <laughs> here's Stella I'm gonna I'm gonna get some music for this portion of the show soon. So you're echoing and conforming to the chord changes. Oops. 
So you get the idea. So you're you're taking a phrase and you're making it conform to the changes that are being up, happening at the time. It's a wonderful exercise, and it's something to think about because what it does is it it gets the listener. It gives the listener a hook. In other words, if we repeat an idea three times, they've heard it three times. They get the idea. Oh, that's cool. Otherwise, what what a lot of times with bebop, what you get is a new a phrase, now another new phrase, now another one, 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 now another one. You can't remember any of them. So as a listener. <clears throat> so repetition, <clears throat> echoing, sequencing, very important. And it's fun and it's easy. Once you get one done, now you know what to do for the next three measures or six measures, you know? Let me do it again. So again, that that's the idea of it all. Awesome. Yeah, he said, um, let's see, superb answer and demo. Thanks a ton. I get the idea for sure. And it's a great way to think because motific vocabulary is uh, essential as well. Motific. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's oh, a word. Good word. Um, Sean asked a little while ago, uh, Rich, can you talk about how you visualize the fretboard when playing bebop? Well, I'll tell you what I've been trying to do for a while, and it's hard because we always think in patterns. We always think, you know, okay, and here is a, here's a B-flat chord. If I go like this... There's the, that lick works. All right, so now what I've been trying to do is forget about associating a chord, a lick with a chord, which is what Joe Pass always said to do, which is obviously worked great for him. I'm trying to go the other direction with working with looking at the fretboard, knowing what notes I want to play, and just relating it to the notes of, of whatever scale or key I'm in. You know what I mean? So. to do just I mean you, you we rely on patterns and uh, that nothing wrong with that I'm just trying to 
force myself to just think about the chords. And the same thing when you're playing chords, that you not only just think about the chord you're playing, but the notes of the chord, maybe just playing a, a few notes of the chord, not the whole thing, getting rid of the root, you know, playing uh, so just some of the factors of the chord so that uh, it gets a better, cool, cooler sound, you know. So instead of playing this, you know, you might play this. And then this. <laughs> and that weird sound. Or the you know. So that's what I've been trying to work on. And that's, that's what I'm doing with a lot of my... Uh, Students is trying to get them to see the fretboard as a key and altering some of the tones within the key to make some of the chords that, that bring out the secondary dominance and what have you. And then you can also superimpose those. And that's a, this is a long story. Uh, superimpose those over just the five chord of the key. So uh, that, that's a whole different ball game. Well, what do you think, Wes? What do you think? Do you think we're done here? No. Uh, there's uh, several more questions here. Uh, Charles K., what are good choices for guitar amplifiers? Um, which people helped him out here. Uh, Sean said the AER Compact 60 is a, a good portable option. Have you uh, heard of that before? I've heard of it. I've never played out of it. Right. Um, and then uh, Danielle said i'm happy with the henriksen uh bud six amp which you played those pretty good right yeah yeah i like the, the bigger one better but yeah uh, yeah henriksen wonderful amps i've been you know playing out of quilters as you all know probably you know for a long time now so i, I like the quilters but yeah those are seem like three strong choices absolutely uh, yeah stay away from the fender amps i for an art stop. Right. I, I don't think I'm voiced correctly. Um, uh, are, you, are you trying to get out of here or what? We still got some stuff to talk about. Do you need to take a break? No, go, go no, I, a... I don't. I don't. Go uh, ahead. Do, do your talk. Well, All right, I, I'll take a break. I'm just go, go. I'm curious as you're playing the ending song. Well, it's it's been an hour and a half. Uh, yeah. Well. Do you have any news? Yeah. All right, why don't you do your news? Okay, cool. Uh, Gibson, um, you know how we've talked about Gibson before, about their, wow, we just found this crazy plans for old guitars in the vault, or we just found this old video of us making guitars in the late 50s in the vault, and we no one knew it existed, but our vault, it was in this vault. <laughs> it's just the thing with Gibson. But uh, now they've found this new discovery, but it turns out it wasn't in the vault. It was on eBay. So they found a massive collection of blueprints, schematics, uh, original manuals for guitar amps, effects pedals um, that were all produced by the brand before 1970. Guitar World uh, got wind of it. Um... Yeah, Gibson VP of product Matt Kohler says, uh, in my time at Gibson, I've been fortunate enough to help preserve and organize our historic archives as well as recover historic documents. Um, but this latest discovery is unbelievable. Recovered the entire Gibson brand's amplifier and effects archives from 1936 to 1969. Schematics, blueprints. Um, work instructions, promo photos, frequency analysis, notes, memos, tons of stuff. Um, so anyway, um, what happened was uh, apparently a former employee had held on to these records and then put them up on eBay. Someone told that VP of product about it and he was like, well, we got we to gotta buy them back. We got to have them back. So... So they're now back in the hands of uh, Gibson. And, What'd they pay for them? Uh, that, was, that part is undisclosed. 
but uh, you can see here that big file. Wow, that stuff. whole file? Yeah, so tons of old documents and old stuff that I guess they just let one of the employees just take it home one day, which is <laughs> really weird. But, hey, that's what Gibson is known for. They're really weird stories about old stuff. So, um, uh, apparently one of the... the uh, things was uh, the original labels and stuff for Gibson's Rhythm King amplifier, um, early 60s amps, and some um, original Epiphone guitar designs, and uh, several Maestro branded pedals. So, <laughs> Remember so, the Maestro phase shifter? Who could forget that? Yeah. Um, and then um, I had mentioned this one uh, earlier, and that was, um, you know, the in, uh, owner of the Indianapolis Colts, uh, Jim Ursay, uh, he is the owner of one of the, uh, the biggest, um, guitar collections right. ever, um, some of the most famous things. Well, he's just revealed in a recent interview that, um, some con conglomerate from Dubai has offered to buy his entire collection for $1.1 billion. For how much? $1.1 billion. No way. This guitar collection that he has, um, which includes, you know, things like David Gilmore's Black Fender Stratocaster, Jerry Garcia's Tiger guitar, a strap Bob Dylan used uh, to go electric at the Newport Jazz Festival or Newport Folk Festival, uh, the Fender Mustang that Kurt Cobain used in the Smells Like Teen Spirit video, and he also has what's t said to be the o the world's only complete Beatles drum kit. Now in this collection, there's also a ton of sports memorabilia too. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so yeah, he, they, the, this, the, the company said, Hey, we want to buy this all. If we buy it all, we're moving it to Dubai. Um, and Ursay said, no, he turned it down. So it's staying here. Oh, wow. the, the cool thing about, uh, Ursay is that he, um, he loves, uh, he, he puts it on display for people. So right. it was on tour a little while back. Some of the guitars he'll let people play at concerts and stuff. Like apparently recently he's let um, someone play David Gilmore's Black Fender Stratocaster. I think it was Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Um, hmm. So in, anyway, it's pretty cool. He he does like open it up to the public and let people enjoy these iconic pieces. You know, that's um, cool. But God, wouldn't it be hard to turn down one point one billion dollars for for all that? Um, but some of the stuff he, he's paid for, you know, the, the Kurt Cobain guitar, I think he played, he paid $4 million for something like that. Some kind of crazy, uh, crazy, um, yeah. some kind of crazy price. But anyway, you know, what's funny too about this story is he also revealed what his favorite guitar out of his whole collection is. Right. And it's the, the one that, um... The uh, the strat that Bob Dylan used to go electric at the Newport Folk Festival, hmm. um, he said, uh, just has a, 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 um, a pretty funny story behind it. Apparently, it's this famous moment, which I don't know much about, but someone tried to then cut the Pete Seeger, tried to like cut the, the cord. While he was playing it, oh really? Yeah, because you know right, he's, cause they, it's cause a folk was... festival, and he's yeah. like, nope. Nah. So, anyway, it's got you know this um, crazy story behind it. But Urse says, uh, "I've put this, I've put this uh, collection together for 25 years with blood, sweat, and tears. The collective of this collection is so incredible because there's nothing like it at all. You can't get these things anymore. You can't get Jerry Garcia's guitar anymore. You can't get David Gilmore Strat. You can't get a Beatles drum set. It's just it's one of a kind stuff. So all right, why right. Mm, yeah. why give it away? And um, you know I guess that's really awesome for him because I mean at a certain point he's got so much money that like do you really need another you know billion dollars? What are you going to do with it? Buy another football team, maybe? Who knows? Um, 
But anyway, so maybe one day we'll get to check out that collection and maybe he'll add a Rich Severson guitar to it one day, you know? Just sell him one of your guitars for a million bucks. Yeah, okay, get, let's do that. See let's if he'll uh, go for it. Yeah, why not? Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Crazy, Bess. Well, yeah. thank you, thank you. That's the news of the day. All right. And then one other thing that I wanted to mention. Okay, go ahead. Was, uh, go ahead, yep. Was that we're, we're thinking about trying to start a, um, a new, so you do the Yosemite Jazz Workshop. Right. Yeah, most people know that. It's a week-long thing in the summer up right. near Yosemite. You come, you give classes, you play concerts, you allow, allow the students to play in public, and everyone just has a grand old time. You've done it for about 20 years, right? Right. And so now that we live on the Central Coast and we live in one of the most beautiful places in California... That's true. Um, which is very accessible from the north, from San Francisco, the Bay Area, very right. accessible from the south. Boom. Right in the middle of California. Let's do a workshop here. So we've been thinking about this for a while, and um, we're kind of uh, wondering. I What I'm kind of wondering is, um, would you guys, first off, come to a weekend guitar festival workshop? So... It would it would include um, some classes during the day. You would get a few guest teachers. The uh, concert maybe so like maybe a concert Friday night, and then classes during the day Saturday with another concert, and then classes during the day Sunday with another concert. Um, something like that. We would get a few guests, uh, teachers, that sort of thing. Um, you know, what's your kind of what do you, what do you think? Well, would you guys come to that? I would. Yeah. Well, you we we'd be making you come for uh, sure. But, you know, but what one thing that I would envision is not so much classes like um, like we do at the workshop. It wouldn't be that intense. It would be more like. It would be like one big class. Yeah, like a, a guy would would like a, put put on a class about something, but there would be a lot of playing. And you you could ask students to play too. They have a student uh, area, almost like the Czech convention. They have they have a, like a little area somebody can sign up and play, and uh, but also have a lot of other concerts, if you will, forty five minute little deals, question and answer with stuff uh, throughout the day. And we we were thinking in in March. Somebody asked what time of year March. You know, yeah, when be, it's uh, kind of crappy weather in the Midwest. and Right, winter. It'd be like towards the end of winter. We'd want to, because in the winter here is when it really starts getting nice. It'd yeah, be like it's 70 really degrees over by the ocean. And it's like, it's really sweet. Um, and then you go 15, 20 miles inland and it's like, it's cold and <laughs> foggy. And so the beaches, and so that would be a part of the draw too. Is we would have it in a you know one of these little beach towns at a little you know kind of resorty sort of place where there would be hotel rooms on site. They got bars, restaurants. Plus you're kind of you know really close to the little town if you wanted to go check it out. Um, yeah, we're but, thinking Cambria. Right. So so yeah, Cambria. like the the uh, the Cambria. the uh, the vision would be. Like a, a class would be like, hey, you, you teach a class, say say we get 70 people to come, right? And the, all 70 would be in this one room. You would teach them maybe like one concept f for like half an hour, 45 minutes, and then turn it over to Q&A. Because I figured Q&A is what people would want to want to do. They want to be able to ask yeah. you questions, yeah. um, that sort of thing. Um, and then, yeah, that's another thing that I had mentioned was... Maybe for one of the nights, having like an open jam instead of a con of like a concert, it would be like an open jam. So you would be up there. We'd have a, a bass player. We'd have a drummer, and you people could sign up on a list and have a, like a five minute slot. Maybe we can like you could pick sure. you could pick out like 15, 20 songs or something that like people could choose from that you mm -hmm. know you know. 
Uh-huh. And they'll, you know, be like, hey, yeah, I want to I wanna get up there and have a little sign-up sheet for 25 sign-ups. Because I would figure a lot of guys wouldn't want to do that or they'd be, feel too intimidated, intimidated to do that. But right. is that something that you guys think you would you would want to do would be like go up on stage and actually play and I, I don't know I think that would be entertaining for jazz guys that are learning just to see what their peers are kind of learning you know like oh you know these guys I want to see some you know Robin Riggs said he'd come yeah and he said Mike Dana's house yeah we could have it at Mike Dana's house my god it's big enough yeah um <laughs> So, so yeah. Oh, Joel Powell is here. That's who I thought Joel Henderson was, was Joel Powell. Oh, yeah. yeah. Joel. <laughs> yeah. What's happening, man? So, anyway, um, if you guys have other suggestions, you know, um, leave them in the, leave me in, in the comments. Um, it's something that we're working up. It'd be fun to get it going this winter if we could, you know. Like I said, it's, uh... It's a great little town over there mm-hmm. in Cambria. It's super so, pretty. And hey, uh, the you, resort that we're thinking of, uh, Cam- Cambria Pines Lodge, mm-hmm. super cool, man. Super. So. We were Gail and I were just there for our fifty third wedding anniversary. Right. Wow. And uh, so we spent uh, a day in Cambria at the lodge. It, it had a fantastic dinner there. Oh my god. Anyway, it's a. Cool, cool lodge, and uh, they have real nice rooms all over the place in this big layout. There's, it, it, it could really be something. This this facility, it would really make it something special for for this festival to have that facility. Yeah, it would be cool. They, plus, they have that little outdoor amphitheater thing too. Oh, it, that's true. It, yeah, that little no, outdoor they, thing is cool. There's also a little pavilion, outdoor pavilion that's right. got all all the heaters, and I I could see it being really, we could really, we we could really make it into a really good time and uh, a lot of people. So yeah, and then at the end of the night, a big party with a bunch of you know like-minded jazz people, and God, that people would love it. And they got a nice bar and restaurant in there, and um, so. So anyway, if you guys have any uh, suggestions or any maybe people, uh, one thing that I I had uh, was thinking too is remember when I was talking about um, trying to find other YouTube guys to come out to like a festival, right? Yeah, like, that's a great idea. Hit up some uh, some other guys on YouTube, you know, like Matt Warnock or the um, Jens Larson or. You know, some of these bigger name jazz, not bigger name, but bigger YouTube name guys that have a big following on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, see if they wanted to come out. And um, So if you have any suggestions of YouTubers or people that you think might want to do that, like let us know in the comments section. I would, we'd, we'd love to hear what you guys have to say. And um, yeah, as we kind of shape this and. My friend, it's, I'm I'm excited about it. I think it I think it's a good idea, and it's and it's uh, it's a just a, a nice destination for people to come. Yeah, so, and if we know. if we get it get the bugs out, do it do it. Not that there's bugs at the lodge, but just I'm talking about just. All right. You know what I mean. Yeah. So um, then you know the following year is always so much easier. And uh, start getting uh, similar to the Rocky Mountain Festival. I think it'll be a lot like that. Um, that's the way I envision it. A few classes, a lot of playing, a lot of hanging out. Um, Tim Lurch would be great. Uh, right. That's yeah. We'll get yeah. That'd be. Yeah, I'm sure he'd come. Right. And it's accessible. We got. There's a lot of LA cats that are so close. You know, and come and play. Um, a couple more quick, quick questions here. Lachlan McClay says, uh, do you use different types of picks depending on what you're playing? Yeah. Um, I, I use this one if I feel like I'm gonna, it's going to fall out of my hand. Or I use this one sometimes. So just this one's nice. It, it's a little brighter. 
So, yeah, I, I pick them out. I, I pick my picks. Yeah, so we celebrated 53 years. 53 years. Can you believe it? And we met this couple on the beach. Real nice couple. And we got to talking. They were celebrating their uh, 65th wedding anniversary, I think it was. Something like, yeah, something like that. 60 or 68. It was crazy. Um um, so anyway, and they're, they, they look fantastic. They, they were like late 80s, maybe early 90s, I don't know. But they, they looked fantastic. They were in great shape. They, I'm like, wow, you guys are a, a real inspiration. Nice. Yeah, it was really nice. Um, Danielle Emberly said, do you use any measurement tools when setting relief in action? Stuff is not easy to see. My luthier had glasses that look like something you would see a surgeon using. <laughs> no, I don't. I, you know, your straight edge is your string. You can tell by you put a finger here and you put a finger here. And that's how you're going to tell your relief. You know, if it bounces on the string there. If it's got too much, you know, there's too big of a gap of bouncing there. If it doesn't bounce at all, it's, uh, you don't have enough. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, that, that's, I don't, I don't use measurements. Set um, it, set it down until it buzzes and then raise it up a little. Let's see. Um, Tango, Juliet, loving my Eastman 580 in gorgeous blue that you sold to me. Oh, I had so many calls about that guitar. If I had 20 of them, I would have sold them all. So you got something special there. Um, let's see. Yeah, he says, I can't believe it's been three years. Has it really? Still loving it. Wow, that's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, good for you. That's great. George Cole. Um, David Island says, hey, for me in Colorado, there's an Archtop Festival, Rocky Mountain Archtop Festival show in Arvada, September 8th through 10. Have you decided whether you're going to that? No, as a matter of fact, I just uh, texted uh, Peter because I'd like to find out if he wants me to play there or teach, then I'll go. Otherwise, I don't want to go. Right. I mean, I, I, I'd love to go. And we have family there, too. So, But I'm just so burned out. I'm getting tired. Old man, I'm getting tired. I'm tired, tired of traveling. Yeah. So let's play a little blues and then uh, okay. get some something to eat. So yeah, if you guys, uh, we'd love to hear your comments about that. Thank you. 
Classic ending there. Yes. Swing. Swing. All right, guys. Well, th I want to thank you guys for joining us. Um, thank you so much. Remember, if you don't show up, we're not going to either. So this is your live stream. So George Cole, thanks for joining us. Yeah, you had that wonderful 575. I'm glad you're loving it still. Wait, wait, what is this one? What does the ES7 set compare to a Guild X150? My wistfully made 150 with the Duncan. Benedetto PDF sounds brighter than any of my Gibsons. L4 with vintage. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Guess not. The, uh, if you have an L4... Compared to the 150, the 150 is uh, laminate. Again, hey, we'll see you next week with a brand new show. Have a blessed week. Adios.